NVIDIA, officially the first company to hit a $5 trillion market cap. The rally in shares after a slate of reveals at its GTC event and on optimism for its Blackwell sales to China or potential sales. For more, let's bring in Doug Clinton, Intelligent Alpha founder and CEO. Doug, it's great to see you as always. What do you make of this latest leg up in NVIDIA at a time where there are all these questions about an AI bubble and here comes NVIDIA like, well, let's let's take another leg up here. That's usually how it happens, Julie, as, as funny as that is to say, when everybody starts talking about, hey, are we in a bubble? Uh, I think counterintuitively markets usually do the things that people don't expect, and that is they just keep going up and NVIDIA is leading the charge. I think that what we're seeing with NVIDIA is the reality that none of the hyperscalers are going to stop spending on CapEx, building out the AI infrastructure that we've seen over the past year plus now. And I think that that's just being factored into NVIDIA. The reality is that numbers will probably continue to go up from NVIDIA. There's this catalyst maybe with China, maybe China gets opened up for Blackwell and that could be additional upside, but it just feels like all things are kind of going right for NVIDIA right now and the AI trade more broadly. I mean, the Blackwell question is is a maybe, is indeed a maybe right now. We don't know if uh, they're, China and the U.S. are going to come to an agreement on that. So how p- pivotal is NVIDIA, um, how pivotal is that for NVIDIA? I mean, the shares had already been pushing up towards a record even without that news. I think that it's probably not fully priced in. I mean, if I had to put odds on Blackwell, just the full out, the GB200, I think President Trump called it the super duper chip, kind of the high end chip. I think it's probably 10 to 20 percent that that gets fully opened up at this point. And so if we did see that happen, I would imagine that Nvidia stock uh, would probably go even higher. In the nearer term, though, this week, we will have earnings from several of the hyperscalers. And I think we're going to hear continued commentary around them not slowing down in terms of their infrastructure builds. And maybe that's sort of what the market is pricing in now, just getting a little bit ahead of that positive commentary. Do you think that there will be any acceleration in spend from here? Do you, or do you think it's more of, I mean, it, it, they're already huge numbers, to be fair. But do you think that it's, it's a matter of, of maintaining that pace of spending? I think some of the numbers are actually probably too low. If you look at the street CapEx numbers for Google and Amazon in particular, the street's at 12 and 9% for next year. And to put that into context, Meta, the street's expecting about 40%. So I think something has to give, and my gut is we'll probably see Google and uh, Amazon talking about continuing to spend more. I think those street numbers have to come up. It may not necessarily represent an acceleration, but I think it will represent a pretty strong continuation of what they've been doing. Doug, what's also intriguing is the the raft of partnerships that NVIDIA announced during that Washington, D.C. GPT. I mean, everything from Uber to Lucid, we've got a list of some of them up on the screen here. Nokia, that was an interesting and surprising (laughs) one. Um, So there's this, the ecosystem continues to grow, right? Originally, we talked a lot about the circular economy with OpenAI at the center of that. And now you have all these other companies that aren't squarely in the AI business that are doing all of this. Does that mean that the potential for growth is expanding or is it also that the potential for risk is expanding? I think it's probably, Julia, an embrace of what these sorts of announcements a partnership does for stock prices. I mean, I think uh, management teams are acutely aware of the reality that if you announce a deal with NVIDIA or OpenAI, uh, you're probably going to have a pretty good day on the stock well, market. Well, okay, so Doug, so, so that's that's a little bit of a cynical view, a realistic view, but like, <laughs> so so how real then is it? Like, you know, you've seen, it's not just NVIDIA, like people are saying, oh, you throw ChatGBT in an announcement and the stock goes up, but is it actually going to yield more profits for shareholders at the end of the day? I, and I, that's the perfect point, because that's actually all that matters at the end of the day. The way that we have thought about this whole circular economy question is, yes, there are a lot of partnerships. Everybody feels like they are entangled. But the only thing that matters at the end of the day, when we kind of look out three, five, seven years from now, is does this technology create incremental cash flows that justify all of this spending? It's not going to do it this year. It's not going to do it next year. No one should expect that. But I think when we think about that longer term picture, five and seven years, 
ultimately that will be the determinant about whether these are good partnerships, whether these are good deals or not. I think that when we see ones with, you know, an Uber, for example, NVIDIA maybe is a little bit uh, outside of that. But the question is just, you know, what are we really going to see from a deal perspective? What can that really add to Uber's core business? And maybe there's something there that we're not aware of yet, but those feel like they're a little bit more on the very heavy optionality side versus the potential to add incremental value to the AI trade. Gotcha. So um, that's a little bit more of a wait and see perhaps on that front. Another partnership that I want to ask you about that was solidified even more this week was between Microsoft and OpenAI, with OpenAI completing um, its recapitalization, restructuring, and then effectively being almost equal partners in the new the new structure. Does that mean for you, is, is Microsoft even more of a buy than ever because of that exposure and that sort of codified exposure? Well, I'll tell you, Julie, at Intelligent Alpha, we use large language models. We're big believers in AI, right. and we use those models to do our stock analysis and portfolio management. Microsoft is a stock that our models like and we own. And so I think the reality is Microsoft continues to be probably the best direct exposure to open AI, which is obviously the best positioned, I think, AI company in the world right now. Uh, I think that this partnership and this announcement, it's actually sort of a win-win for both sides in a sense, where I think it unlocks open AI to kind of continue to raise additional capital. They're gonna bring on other capital partners in the future because they have huge capital needs. Um, and I think for Microsoft, obviously, you know, they have a, as you mentioned, very large stake in what I think will probably ultimately be, you know, another multi-trillion dollar company in the next few years. Um, and of course, that multi-trillion dollar company is coming public in the next few years also. Um, you know, it's too early for you to buy it as a public company, for any of us to buy it as a public company. But, you know, what do you think that that effect will be in the market? Like, does it sort of suck all the air out of the room from everything else when that finally comes public? It'll definitely be a watershed moment, I think. And you know, in my view, I've always thought about boom cycles in a very simplistic way, which is when the IPO window really opens up, I think that's when you have to be thinking a little bit more conservatively, uh, where that could be getting more toward the end. Now, OpenAI, they haven't gone public. And when they go public, I don't think that is necessarily the end of the AI trade. But what it could ultimately do is kind of open up the window for everybody else. And that's when I think I would really start to pay attention. I think there will be a huge amount of demand to own open AI for the long term. You'll have a lot of investors interested in doing that. But I think you'll also see because of that demand, uh, other companies will test the IPO waters and likely we'll see a lot of other companies go public that aren't quite the quality of open AI. And that's when I think you can start to maybe really sound this bubble alarm that we're hearing right now in a more honest way. Um, I, I think you said in your notes to us that open AI is too big to fail. Is that is that how it's is that sort of a deliberate strategy on its part? I don't know if it was deliberate at the outset, but it, it sort of seems that that's where they've been going. I mean, if you look at the partnerships that they have created now with uh, Broadcom, NVIDIA, AMD, it just feels like Oracle. I mean, everybody in the industry now is tied to OpenAI. They all have a vested interest in some way for that company to succeed. And so the way I think about this too big to fail concept is we get these questions about how can OpenAI continue to finance all these huge projects they're talking about? Well, the way they can continue to finance it is through all these partnerships that they've made and all these companies that have this really vested interest in uh, supporting them and making the company successful. And so I think it's it's probably become part of the strategy is look, if we can get tied to everybody and make sure that everybody you know, sort of needs us to su succeed in some sense to keep the stock rally going, you know, it, it almost could become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think Sam Altman is sort of smart enough to realize that. Um, and Doug, finally, going into these, um, more of these big cap tech earnings, I know you guys don't own Amazon, why not? Yeah, it's, it's been one that the models uh, that we use at Intelligent Alpha, they haven't really liked it all year. And and that has been the right call because Amazon has been the worst performer of the MAG-7 year to date. I think there's two things. You know, One is just as a human observer from the outside, this recent layoff announcement, the timing of it just feels a little bit suspect. 
you know, from a political sort of 101 standpoint, if you were going to have great earnings, you probably don't want to announce earnings uh, or, or announce layoffs two days ahead of those great earnings. You'd probably want to wait a little bit. Um, and so that just it's, it's a yellow flag, right? I might be looking too much into that, but it's just something that just doesn't sit well with me. Um, the other thing, though, is AWS. And if you look at the growth in AWS, it was 17.5% in Q2. The street's looking for an acceleration now in Q3. And I think that Google and Microsoft have done an incredible job competing in the cloud space, really leading on AI, where Amazon, I would argue, is in third place, even though they're the biggest cloud provider. I think they're probably third place in terms of AI in the cloud. And I'm concerned that they might not quite meet that bar. Uh, and I think our models feel the same way, and that's why we haven't owned the stock. Doug, it's always good when the, when the computers agree with you, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> much for being here. It's good to see you. Thanks, Julie. We're NVIDIA CEO Jensen Wong delivering the keynote address at NVIDIA's GTC conference there in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday, announcing a bunch of new partnerships, including with Uber, CrowdStrike, and the Department of Energy. Today, we're announcing that the Department of Energy is partnering with NVIDIA to build seven new AI supercomputers to advance our nation's science. I have to have a shout out for Secretary Chris Wright. He has brought so much energy to the DOE, a surge of energy, a surge of passion to make sure that America leads science again. For more, we're bringing it out. Daniel Newman, CEO at Futurum. Dan, it is always great to see you. Maybe start here, Dan. You know, the big debate, which we've discussed, Dan, AI boom or AI bubble. You have NVIDIA there today making just a slew of news, right? Um, all these announcements, the energy department, Palantir, Uber, Nokia, CrowdStrike. D does all of this, Dan, does it give us any greater line of sight, any clarity into that debate, AI boom or AI bubble? Josh, good to see you. The Super Bowl of AI now happens more than one time a year. That's great. Um, it was a big moment and you saw the stock rally over $200 big inflection, big moment for the company. And I've been trying to burst the bubble bears bubble for some time now. Everyone's saying it's a bubble. Well, Jensen came out and helped my cause. He basically said he has line of sight to half a trillion dollars in revenue for Blackwell Rubin through the end of 2026. And those partnerships that you mentioned, whether it's CrowdStrike, whether it's Palantir, whether it's ServiceNow, um, the DOE, these are all commitments to consume massive amounts of AI, massive amounts of GPUs. All of this infrastructure that people are questioning, is it a circular deal? Are there only a couple of companies benefiting? We are seeing that moment, Josh, where the pivot happens, where people are willing to spend money to get value from AI. I've been saying this for a while. Jensen did a great job validating it today. On that point you mentioned there, Dan, this kind of web of circular deals, all right? I wanted your take on this, because this was another announcement today. This Nokia news, from what I understand, Dan, NVIDIA invests one billion in Nokia, and then NVIDIA chips will be used to accelerate Nokia software for 5G and 6G networks. To your point, th this, is, this is a yellow flag some have, been, some have been throwing here, right? These kind of circular web of deals where folks say, you know, NVIDIA invests in company A, and then company A is going to use NVIDIA's tech, um, in your opinion, is there any kind of warning, a yellow flag? Do you get, do you get dot .com echoes there, Dan? I don't see the dot .com echoes. What I do see is NVIDIA as one of the largest companies, now the largest uh, by market cap in the world, picking key secular trends, in this case, 5G, 6G com uh, communications, connectivity. I'm walking around Washington, D.C. here at the event, and there's times where I can barely get signal. We need to make these improvements. You know, AI working with the... 5G and then 6G communications technologies can improve connectivity. It can improve the amount of energy used to deliver that connectivity. There's so many benefits. So Jensen right now has the opportunity leading NVIDIA to pick these companies that he wants to collaborate with. Now, of course, the fact that so much of this is built on NVIDIA is a tribute to their success right now. And this is why when you hear about companies like Broadcom, companies like AMD winning more deals, I think that's a good thing. But I think going into this week, what we're going to really want to hear is from these cloud companies, for instance, Microsoft and, and Amazon, they're reporting this week, and as well as Alphabet. We're going to want to hear that their growth is more consumption of AI by these enterprises, by these businesses, by these government entities. I think Jensen was sending signals. I think he was giving some, some breadcrumbs with some of these deals he's making. But these are the largest companies in the world using that technology to build products that are going to be consumed. That isn't just going to be five or six companies. I think it's all very positive. 
Dan, great to see you as always, my friend. Appreciate it. Good to see you. We're working together to connect these NVIDIA drive Hyperion cars into a global network. And now in the future, you'll you know, be able to hail up one of these cars and the ecosystem is going to be incredibly rich and we'll have Hyperion or robo-taxi cars all over the world. Joining me now on the ground from DC, our very own tech editor, Dan Howley. Dan. Yeah, Josh, obviously a, a ton of announcements here from Jensen, from NVIDIA. Uh, he's just had a press Q&A where he was discussing things uh, related to the U.S. and China, basically saying how the U.S. is ahead as far as AI goes, uh, way ahead as far as chips go. But there is the risk of falling behind if we don't continue to invest in AI and continue to see uh, immigrants come in and start to work in those areas. He also, during the event itself, laid out a number of announcements, including a deal with Lilly, which we'll see that company take 1,000 uh, GPUs to uh, work on drug discovery. Also working with, obviously, the Department of Energy, building out seven supercomputers for the department, uh, including one that will have 10,000 GPUs, uh, and then just a litany of other deals, uh, such as with CrowdStrike, uh, and so on and so forth. And this is just kind of the cadence that we see with NVIDIA events, where they host these big get-togethers, these GTC conferences, whether here in DC, uh, the main one in uh, San Jose, or uh, across the world, and they have these major announcements and it helps to push the stock price forward.